Good evening. My name is Brian Pilkington and I am Associate Professor at the School of Health and Medical Sciences here at Seton Hall University, as well as Associate Professor at the Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine, uh, and I work in the College of Nursing in the Department of Philosophy too. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Dignity Series. This series was created to bring together scholars of national and international prominence to engage members of the Seton Hall communities on pressing issues of our shared human experience. The lectures in this series force us to confront violations of human dignity by raising awareness of such violations and offering resources for reflection and response. This evening's lecture will be delivered by Professor Wupiniski, which my apologies, Professor, I hope that's uh, close enough, uh, who follows some excellent presentations by Professor Patrick Smith of Duke University, Professor Michael Stebbins, the Toth Lonergan Visiting Professor uh, at Seton Hall University, and Dr. Lydia Dugdale of Columbia University. Professor Rupiniski's talk entitled Dignity, Personalism, Health and the Law is based on his forthcoming book, Human Dignity and the Law, A Personalist Account. Uh, what impressed me most uh, about the book, and I'd encourage you all to pick up a copy when it comes out, is the depth of engagement with a breadth of philosophical traditions in, the, in an attempt to construct an account of dignity from within the law, not merely a moral account that is then derivatively applied to legal questions. In fact, Professor Rupiniski's, uh, he describes his central claim early in the text that the normative expression and prescription of such relations in the norms related to human dignity are not a mere historical contingency. It is a consequence of the real connection between legal activity on the one hand and natural human personhood on the other. Thus rooting dignity within the law is not a way to avoid complicated philosophical critiques uh, of the concept, its justifications and the normative implications of its use. He engages these on their own merits but rather a sophisticated and deeply considered approach to conceptualize the space that law can create for human dignity on its own terms. I am no legal scholar, but if I may, uh, Professor Rupiniski's use, analysis, and critique of particular legal philosophies greatly advances what I've read um, considering dignity in the law. His lecture will be followed by two comments, uh, first by me and then Professor Michael Bauer, who I will very briefly introduce now. Professor Michael Bauer is Associate Professor of Philosophy and Adjunct Professor of Law at Fordham University and the Brian and Kathleen McLean Fellow um, from 2020 to 2022. We will then entertain uh, questions from our audience and online. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rupininski from uh, who's visiting us at Seton Hall straight from Poland. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Brian, for a warm welcome and uh, for uh, receiving me here. It's, it's very nice to, to, to be here. Um, uh, I come from Poland. I teach at the University of Łódź at the Faculty of Law and Administration. Uh, yes, and <clears throat> uh, Brian has been very nice uh, <laughs> to, uh, to my uh, book, so you already have a sense of what the book is about. Um, the, this book actually uh, comes out of a, let's say, a, a problem with dignity that we have, I think, both in moral discourse, but in legal discourse especially. So it's not, and, and to, some, to some point, I think it was, it could have been considered as an un unproblematic notion, but at some point it got problematic. So now preliminaries for, for those of you who are not um, yeah, interested in, I mean, who have not uh, done research about human dignity in the law, I must mention that before World War II, the term was actually almost absent in the law. It appeared here and there, for instance, in the preamble to the Irish constitution, in uh, the German constitution related to social law, but in general we could say that it was like almost absent. Of course, the law has its own 
um, term dignitas, dignity understood as a, a high status, but only of some individuals. And well, it, it's already a tension between human dignity, which is supposed to be equal, and the status of dignity, which is supposed to be attributed to the um, only elevated somehow individuals in the, in the society. So, of course, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights introduced the idea of human dignity as inherent, that is inscribed somehow into the very being of a, of a human person, uh, inalienable, so you cannot get rid of it, basically, you cannot lose it, inviolable, in a sense that you should not or you must not violate it, and equal to all human beings. And it's also remarkable that the term has been largely used in uh, constitutional law, especially, and a particular emphasis was given to human dignity in countries which needed to sort of cut off the atrocities of the past, especially the German constitution, also South African after the apartheid. So basically, <clears throat> We could say that, um, uh, yes, and, and, and in recent decades, the term has been used more extensively as a, let's say, a, a reason for a particular normative statement. So instead of being simply a some sort of um, evocation or perhaps some kind of a common commitment, foundational commitment, it has become uh, to be used more and more as a reason as a justificatory reason and that's actually the part of the the problem <laughs> and uh, we could say i we could speak i think about the puzzles of dignity that dignity as a concept is very rich uh, and evokes many many different opposing ethical conceptions metaphysical views religious commitments and as i mentioned before well, it has generated a general, but probably quite shallow consensus on human rights, right? But at the same time, generated and actually is generating somehow perhaps even more and more uh, disagreement in terms of the more specific context. Just to give you a general map of those um, opposite sort of directions, that dignity could take us. <laughs> uh, uh, I prepared the following table. Like on the one hand, human uh, dignity um, is connected to self-determination, our independence, let's say. Oh, sorry for the misspelling here. Uh, but on the other hand, we could say that dignity is very well uh, observed in a situation in which we have individuals that are dependent on others, right? So. On the one hand, we have this autonomy, self-determination. On the other hand, we, we have this vulnerability and dependence on others. Um, as I mentioned before, on the one hand, we have this high privileged status, like dignity is something that somehow elevates you, right? But on the other hand, it's irrevocable, it's inalienable, and it's kind of supposed to introduce the irrevocable equality in the sense that we are supposed to um, whatever you do, whether you're a criminal or you're a person with a very bad condition in whatever that condition is, you still have that inherent dignity, which means you're still equal in terms of dignity to others, right? And also, uh, that kind of resonates with this first uh, opposition. On the one hand, we have this respect for individual will, right? On the other, we have some objective interests <laughs> in like everyone, because of being dignified, having dignity, is, uh, has an objective, important interest in fulfillment. So for lawyers, there is a lot of debate whether rights should be considered as protection of the will or of the interests, and dignity kind of wants it both, right? <laughs> so there are a lot of, basically, a lot of um, problems, and that has um, attracted, perhaps the best way to, to call it is skepticism. <laughs> Right, so the, 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 in recent decades, as dignity became uh, more and more, or has become more and more um, used, also in the legal discourse by judges, the response was 
skeptical, basically. Like the, the famous uh, account offered, for example, by Christopher McCruden, who says that dignity is merely a placeholder. Uh, uh, and I think that skepticism is a, a problem in a way that needs to be overcome because, well, my book tries to um, overcome it in a sense. And uh, there is an interesting passage of Bernard Schlink in this McCruden's um, Companion to Human Dignity, uh, Understanding Human Dignity, that was a couple of years ago issued in Oxford University. And he says, Bernard Schlink, he writes, human dignity is a Zensucht Begriff. <laughs> Uh, begrief. It's a German. Exception and protection of humans is not up to grabs and cannot be overpowered or outmaneuvered or argued down. The longing again is vogue and it will never be fulfilled, but the concept is important. That's that's a position that's quite common today, I think, but it's also, to my mind, although it's uh, probably nothing bad in having a longing for a better word, right? And to unite with the people of goodwill uh, seems seems quite a good thing to, to do. It's in, in a sense, it's a dangerous for human dignity because it makes it dependent on our value judgment. It makes it dependent on our commitments, right? It's not really, and especially for lawyers, it's not really an objective principle, but it's rather a, um, you know, something that, in, in a sense, depends on your com personal commitments even, right? And in this book, I've been trying to show basically that to present a personalist theory of human dignity with the special emphasis on human dignity and the law, which basically shows that human dignity is real, <laughs> right? That there is something that it has perhaps certainly a real substrate substrate and does not depend on our goodwill, our longing, but it's rather like something objective that judges or lawyers should kind of respect and recognize. Uh, <clears throat> some, uh, also, uh, I wanted this, this theory of mine wants to show that the recognition of human dignity is one of the pinnacles of legal system. It's like somehow inherent and as Brian already mentioned, integrates the experience of personhood with legal reality. Because the main idea is that human dignity is uh, in the law, is integrated with the natural human personhood, something that we basically encounter in ourselves in a way, but which also needs to be respected. And also um, the hope was to, at least to some point, um, give some guidance in all those um, hard cases that come with human dignity and all somehow resolve. It's not possible to resolve all the tension, but at least give some guidance in, in perhaps resolving these tensions. So what I come up with is a theory of status of, of the status of personhood. Um, and it's, it's a response to human dignity skepticism. Um, and already Brian mentioned that the book that is coming out, uh, hopefully in August uh, in Routledge, uh, the book is titled uh, Human Dignity uh, and the Law, A Personal Theory. The inspirations of the theory come from outside the law. They come from uh, Polish personalists who did actually anthropology and metaethics um, in the Catholic University of Lublin in the 20th century. Uh, one of them was Karol Wojtyła, um, who later became, became John Paul II, but beforehand he was a cardinal and also a philosopher. Uh, I strongly recommend reading his book, The Acting Person, uh, the best in Polish, I think, I'm afraid, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but yes. And also his disciple Tadeusz Styczeń, uh, uh, who, who uh, was engaged with meta-ethical questions. And my idea was to engaged with a dialogue with those philosophers because I felt like they are um, pointing at something important and try to interpret the law uh, through their uh, lenses, basically, to, through the lens of the personalist conception. So the book proceeds uh, um, as follows. First, I identify those characteristic usages of human dignity in the law. 
and then I, I strive to interpret them uh, by means provided by those personalist philosophers. And well, uh, that story should be longer. How I do it because it's you know it, it's taken me many pages. So uh, all, because of the uh, problems with time, uh, I, I will present to you uh, my results. <laughs> and we, if, if there is a need, we can talk how does it actually work. But the idea is that you need to engage with the phenomenology of human personhood and um, interpret the law with a, with a similar um, with, a, with a similar approach. It's, it's basically some sort of a phenomenological interpretation of the law. And that interpretation arrives at certain conclusions. First, that there are dignitarian interests that human dignity protects. And there is certainly a certain tension between these interests. Sometimes we, you cannot have them at, you know, at the same, all of them at the same time. But you need to find balance between them in, a par in particular cases. And those interests are freedom from degradation, which is um, sometimes, <laughs> although it's kind of obvious, it's sometimes also overlooked in the dignity of literature, that the, the, the first thing that comes, um, as, as the example of torture shows it, for instance, is that this dig the, the interest is uh, freedom from degradation. And we actually wouldn't understand what humiliation is about. We wouldn't understand why torture is so atrocious um, uh, having, uh, if, if, if this uh, dignitarian interest called freedom from the would be absent, right? So that's the first and somehow most basic thing. The second point is self-determination. So, of course, a lot of, uh, and especially in this country, in the United States, a lot of human dignity literature and also of human dignity cases focus on um, autonomy, right? But Actually, I've been trying to uh, make a case that this autonomy or the self-determination is best understood in a specific personalist context. That it's not simply what we want, <laughs> not simply what is in our best interest as we see it, but rather is what we think is true. <laughs> so the, that self-determination self is somehow connected to the to, to truth in, at least in the sense that persons who advocate for their position in the public realm, they at least make claim for truth, right? Uh, and the third uh, dignitarian interest is integration or integrity. So we enjoy certain uh, kind of um, integrity on different levels, right? That, that's what Wojtyla books is about very much, like the, the second part of, of uh, of his book is about integration at the very bodily level, right? At the very basic, basic bodily level, up to the moral level, <laughs> right? And and very much of human dignity jurisprudence is actually um, appreciation of that sort of integrity. Although there there has been discussions about moral integrity and are you actually entitled to impose moral dignity on individuals, and that's that's this problem, right? But uh, I'm trying to kind of solve it. And these dignitarian interests are connected to the principle of the status of personhood, which I advocate as, as the prop, as the, in a sense, the best explication of human dignity and in the law. It's not the only ex uh, explication because I argue that human dignity is basically too rich to say, you know, human dignity is that point. <laughs> it's not possible. But you can look for focal application, focal uses, and I think that principle is, is just that. And it says, before the law, each person equally must be respected as an integrated whole, radically capable of self-determination and striving towards fulfillment. And basically, I argue that it's a cosmopolitan implicit principle of the law. So, of course, many lawyers will not be directly aware of this principle, uh, at, at least unless they read the book. <laughs> but but the, the claim is that if they are not ignorant, if they are 
decent judges, for instance, they, they would kind of apply it in one way or another, which of course highly depends on the particulars of the of the jurisdiction. And uh, what does it mean? What well, the recognition of that principle has some implications for law uh, and for health policy, which I included uh, because of uh, our focus in at certain hall here. So for the law, the implications are uh, that human dignity is some sort of an axiom for the law is not again something imposed from the outside from morality. Here I actually follow a non personal thinker, Jeremy Waldron, whose famous account on dignity as inherently legal. Of course, he's not a personalist, but, but I'm uh, also inspired by this. Uh, I, basically, I think he's right, <laughs> right? So dignity is a sort of an axiom for law. Mm, so therefore, uh, it kind of comes out naturally of the law interacting with persons. Therefore, we don't need to actually justify human dignity, but rather we are using human dignity when we engaged in a, let's say, decent legal discourse. And what follows also from this is that the law affirms persons in its own genuine and important way. It recognizes human capacity for agency, hum but on the other hand, human inter interdependence, uh, so the law um, is not simply a vehicle for the value of human dignity, but rather it's, it's some sort of a space. For example, Hannah Arendt had this idea of space of appearance, right? So it's a little bit similar. It's some sort of a space that is created uh, for a dignity based public order. Of course, some public orders can be can deny that, right? It's possible to deny that, it's possible to violate that, but there are good reasons to think that um, the natural tendency is in fact to recognize that rather than uh, to uh, deny that also uh, fully, right? And also um, other implic further implications is that the law, of course, must, must not be cruel, so the law cannot foster cruelty, but also um, the law must not be ignorant <laughs> in a sense that, for example, judges must not ignore the personal capacities that are at stake in a case. So basically, judges might, must pay careful attention to um, the persons concerned <laughs> uh, and their sort of perspective, their sort of capacities, their personhood, basically. Now, what it means for um, health policies and the law related to health policy is that um, if that principle is accepted, so if that law is, if the law and policies are, let's say, part of this, what I call a decent public order, uh, they should be informed by a special understanding of equality or rather equal dignity of all human persons. So, in a way, and here I owe much to Tadeusz Styczeń, who uh, argued that in the meta-ethical context, but here I argue this, this in, the, in the legal context, human dignity is somehow attached to the very appearance of persons, right? When a person appears, in a sense, in our human world, in this, in this case, in the legal world, it kind of, um, we could say that um, dignity follows that. If you pay, uh, Styczeń said, if you pay careful attention to the appearance of persons, dignity like comes uh, automatically in a sense. Uh, but, and this is drawing from uh, Wojtyla, uh, human dignity is of course not only a source of rights, but is also a source of responsibilities for duties, uh, because if the dignitarian interest is self-determination, understood as a result of engagement with truth, it's also natural to say that um, we are not only uh, holding rights and making claims, but uh, by this virtue of the same thing, which is our dignity, we are required to respond to the morally relevant conditions. Which means, for instance, that highly dependent, because people, of course, the utilitarians, but also New Kantians and many others, <laughs> right? 
they posed these questions. What should we do with persons with severe disabilities, especially with mental disabilities? Right? Do they really count? Uh, also, Brian wrote on this. Uh, yeah, of course. So uh, also there is a big questions of human embryos. But the idea is that if we um, pay careful attention to what personhood means, uh, it becomes obvious that um, they are sources of duties. <laughs> the appearance of persons, let's say, in our world um, bears duties that we need to respond to. Why? Because we have this capacity for agency, for self-determination, but it means that uh, we cannot ignore things, basically. So therefore, um, highly dependent individu individuals, say people with severe disabilities, are sources of duties and not, an, let's say, um, subject of bargains or of ping pong, philosophical ping pong, right? All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I've used pretty much all of my time, so I... <laughs> thanks. All right. Uh, good evening again. Uh, thank you, Professor Rubnuski. Um, that was wonderful, um, and I really appreciated the focus on health. So important um, to us here at the Interprofessional Health Sciences uh, Campus. Um, so I now have uh, the great pleasure uh, and opportunity to discuss Professor Rubnuski's uh, forthcoming work. My short comments will do will not do justice to this excellent book um, but in them i hope to motivate and then raise a question which has plagued me for some time my question belongs uh, in the category of those annoying comments or questions which go something like this i've had a really hard time understanding x you've thought about uh, y really well which is close to x can you help me um, or maybe you've thought about x maybe we're, we're, we're a bit closer than x and y the cluster of questions around the notion of equal dignity or equal dignity under the law, um, and you take this up uh, throughout the text, but in particular in the fourth chapter, are challenging for me to understand. This is because dignity seems to be appealed to in ordinary language in two ways. First, it is used in a universal manner. Dignity is said to apply to all people, all human beings, or all legal persons. Second, dignity seems to be used in a way to mark out the specialness of particular human beings or the best among us. Uh, the next comment, which will be delivered much better than this current comment, uh, comes from Professor Bauer. And in light of the way he carries himself or uh, given his superior intellect or his status as the president-elect of that great philosophical association, the Metaphysical Society, um, pick out your favorite set of human or social features, he surely surpasses me in dignity. Yet we are each, uh, we are said to each possess the same dignity. If we want to be able to make these interpersonal distinctions, and I think we do, then we need some way to reconcile these two concepts, these two interpretations, these two components of human dignity. Human dignity is both, uh, it seems, egalitarian and, for lack of a better term, meritorious. Now, uh, Professor Rubnuski uh, does not go so far as to rely on dignity as the basis, at least as far as I read the book, uh, as the basis for human rights and treatment uh, and general treatment of others. He's focused on uh, dignity within the law, right? Legal dignity. And he avoids the trap that theorists like um, John Rawls, according to his interpretation, um, or I think um, a straightforward reading of uh, Gilbert, fall into. Picking particular properties that are important for let's say counting as one of us, or constructing a kind of threshold view, wherein, to go back to my previous example, uh, Professor Bauer and I are both treated in the same way in spite of our varying degrees of those clusters of important human and social features because we're above some predetermined cutoff, right? So Professor Bauer's way up here, I'm here, but I'm still above the line. Professor Rubnowski uh, does not fall prey to either because as a good personalist, he roots human dignity and experience uh, following carefully upon and in so doing, I think clarifying the work of Pope St. John Paul II uh, among others. 
However, in what is the key section on equal dignity in uh, chapter four, uh, which you will all carefully read when you buy the book when it's out, um, I don't think we quite get an answer to this challenging reconciliation question. We learn, uh, quoting here, uh, equal dignity in the personalist perspective is the fundamental axiom of relating to or deliberating about human persons. We affirm, uh, that is love or respect, other persons in their entirety insofar as we ourselves are able to deliberate and act as a person, close quote. But surely there are some who act and deliberate better than others, even in the experience focused and bro taking experience very broadly um, perspective of the personalist. We are also told, again, quoting from the text, that is why the dignity of the person is concerned, uh, dignity of the person concerned, excuse me, is the axiom of adjudication. And therefore the judge keeping fidelity to the a principle that was up there, the principle of the status of personhood does not merely endorse the abstract ideal of equal dignity to all. She also, and most importantly, keeps fidelity to the real persons affected by the particular act of adjudication. Uh, close quote. In making this point, uh, we can connect um, your arguments to the legal theoretical literature that engages dignity and procedural justice. In particular, I have in mind the work um, of Michael O'Hear uh, on federal sentencing, uh, and this is just uh, his work is focused on the US, and he observes, quote, a large body of procedural justice research teaches that the process through which a legal decision is made may matter as much or even more to the people affected by the decision than the content of the decision. In particular, a legal process that treats participants with dignity and respect may promote respect for the law and the legal system, even if the substance of the decision is adverse. Um, now, barring from Professor Rupnutsky's work, he says, quote, when one thinks in these terms, ascribing the status of personhood equally to all the members uh, of the family has nothing to do with surprise or supererogation. It is simply what a human or perhaps a humane society should do, uh, close quotation. And herein lies the trouble, well, the, the problem I have in thinking about this, herein lies the trouble and the root of my confusion. I'm in agreement uh, on the interdependence of persons, and I think you're right um, that in failing to attend first to uh, humanity of everyone, right, the humanity of all, and in particular persons with disabilities, uh, I think a mistake is made and we get the order of operations back uh, backwards. So I think that's exactly right. I appreciate the focus on the status of persons, right? So we're close. However, I still want to have my practical level prescriptions informed by a robust account of human dignity. And I don't know how to do that without allowing for discriminations in answers to questions about what is um, a flourishing human life? What is a good person? What must a person do or be um, to live up to being considered equal before the law? When an otherwise healthy person requests a limb to be amputated, and for the law to support and enforce uh, compliance with such a request, right, on the physicians and other uh, medical folks would be asked to perform um, the procedure, isn't part of the answer, which I, I think is a negative answer, isn't part of the answer that to act in such a way would not conform to the prescriptions that follow from a proper account of what it is to be human, a possessor of dignity. To ask this another way, and I'll wrap up very shortly, uh, to ask this another way, is there too much normative content baked into that notion of a humane society, which I think might be doing some of the work um, of that notion of meritorious dignity that I um, had mentioned without actually appealing to that and then trying to avoid the tension. This version of the question is motivated by Professor uh, Rubnitsky's engagement uh, with and then departure from Jeremy Waldron's work on dignity. Though rich, interesting, and important, um, at the basis of uh, his view, I believe Jeremy Waldron uh, argues that there's a sea change which occurred in our uh, understanding of dignity from a deference to monarchs to a deference to all, all, all people. Professor Rupnivsky, uh rejects the merely historical account, um, but something else I think is going on here uh, in Waldron's work. And I don't know if this is a friendly amendment or a clarifying question um, for you in the critique of Waldron. Waldron's historical account highlights a reason as to why monarchs were treated with dignity. It might be a bad reason, um, something about royal bloodlines, divine rights of kingship. Um, but in the background, a reason is there. One must merit, uh, for lack of a better term, dignity. There is something about monarchs that distinguishes them from others, even if we got that wrong. 
Waldron's account fails, I think, for a few reasons, many of which you articulated well in the book. Um, but one of those reasons is that when dignity is democratized, when it applies to all, it cannot lose its reason for being. It cannot lose this meritorious aspect. But it does on the Waldron account, and I think that's why Waldron's account doesn't work. That might have been the lengthiest way to ask for help um, on a question on record in this fine auditorium. Um, but uh, after Professor Bauer speaks, if you could help me think through this, I would be in your debt. Um, and again, it's the, the tension in human dignity between how we reconcile claims of equal dignity with this meritorious dignity. Um, so thank you. So thank you, Brian. And let me thank uh, Professor Rupnitsky for uh, his very interesting book and the talk which only covers part of the richness of the book. Um, I think that my comments are going to be largely a series of questions and the questions really center around this worry. In getting from premise to conclusion, is it the case that the account, the personalist account has to rely illicitly on its own terms, illicitly on some account of nature, some naturalistic account, some um, view of what is natural to persons as human beings and not strictly as persons. So my comments will again be a series of questions and they'll be motivated largely from a natural law point of view. And the question is, do we need a little more naturalism than the personalism allows? Because the personalism shares a number of um, family resemblances with tran the transcendental philosophy of Kant, the focus on dignity, um, even the focus on the noumenal self as a kind of self that is um, a, a center of agency and self-determination. Well, how does one understand this center of agency and self-determination if this agent is equally embodied and determined by all sorts of um, em empirical features. So the series of questions I want to unpack really can be characterized in um, un under three ca categories, perhaps. Normativity, equality, and authority. So first to the normativity question, and I may be oversimplifying the account, um, being given, but at the risk of oversimplifying, let me just raise this question. Uh, I, I think it's very promising um, as Professor Rupnitz, Brian, you got me mispronouncing this now, Rupnewski um, says, to begin an account that doesn't require a metaphysics upfront. The account is not meant to provide first a freestanding metaphysical theory of personhood or dignity on the basis of which we then dictate uh, the terms under which law should be institutionalized. What we're looking for is the dignity in the law, not a metaphysics of dignity, which we then impose upon law. However, as Professor Rubniewski himself acknowledges, dignity hasn't always played an explicit role in the law. The positive law can get it wrong. There can apparently be law even without any consideration for dignity. So if it's the case that the law can get it wrong and make no place or no legitimate place or make no correct place for dignity, don't we need some understanding of dignity that is independent of law in order to judge the reliability of our attempt at finding dignity in the law. So from a natural law point of view, um, and there, there is some um, similarity here between natural law and, and the personalist account, at least from my natural law point of view, it's not as if we discern the natural law in some kind of platonic heaven. We find the natural law only in the positive law. Fair enough, but there is also an account of natural law that helps us discern what to find in the positive law and what kinds of positive laws we shouldn't even regard as positive law legitimately understood because they are too lacking in some 
requirement. So some concern for the common good or some concern for justice or some concern for proper authority. So how do we really preserve normativity if we begin with the law without some kind of independent check on the kind of personalism we're seeking to find in the law? That might be a problem, maybe not a problem, but it does seem to be the case that we have to have more than just saying dignity is an axiom for law. Some law seems to lack the right kind of account of dignity. All right, so that's my, my normativity question. The equality question uh, can be cashed out in this way. And again, I'm, I'm borrowing from a natural law, more or less naturalistic account that I, I would want to derive from Aristotle and Aquinas and, and some um, more contemporary thinkers like Michael Thompson and Philip Afoot. Uh, a Platonist might want to think that there is a one size fits all thing called equality. But from Aristotle's point of view, from Thomas's point of view, two things cannot be commensurated, regarded as equal or unequal, except in respect to some third thing. So Peter and Paul are equal. Professor Pilkington and Professor Bauer are equal. In what respect? One cannot answer that question meaningfully unless one specifies the respect within, with, with, uh, uh, in, in accordance with which people are said to be equal or unequal. Peter and Paul are equal in height. They're equal in wealth. They're equal in employment status. They're equal insofar as they're both human beings. And as a result, Peter and Paul are equal insofar as they're both human beings. But Peter is not equal to Fido, who's not a human being. So it it, it seems to be we, we we require some third thing with respect to which and some some visibly identifiable third thing with respect to which we say that Peter and Paul are equal. This notion that um, individuals are equal simply insofar as they are persons sounds a little bit too close to saying they are equal as noumenal selves. There's a kind of invisible center of value or worth or dignity or self-determination or agency that doesn't seem to be doing any significant work on uh, getting us to understand with respect to which or with respect to what the, the agents are said to be equal. So again, this is an Aristotelian to mystic naturalistic account. What counts as equal is always equal in some uh, visible identifiable respects and it matters for the law because it has to be a publicly identifiable, a publicly available, what I'm calling visible respect in which two or more are said to be equal. This touches upon then my third area of questioning um, because the law works by way of giving some and not others decision-making power. It's the problem of authority. If everybody is treated equally in every respect, if everybody is given the power of self-determination such that they should never be forced to live in accordance with a law that they themselves wouldn't endorse, you need unanimity to get anything done. So imagine the situation of the three little pigs who don't have to worry, let's say, about a wolf, but let's say they worry about a storm that is brewing. They're on an island and one little pig says, let's build a dam out of straw. The other says, let's build a dam out of sticks. The third says, let's build a dam out of bricks. And each one of them has good reasons for arguing in favor of the different materials. The straw is easier to get, it's cheaper. We can get more of it more quickly. The storm is gonna come soon. No, but it's not as strong as bricks. Bricks are much stronger. Yes, but it's gonna take us a week to get the bricks. We have to do it out of straw or sticks. Okay, so there's good reason for each of the three little pigs to want to lay down the law in accordance with their own insight. But if they continue to require unanimity, nothing gets done. The storm comes and they all get destroyed. The solution to the problem of um, unfeasible unanimity in the context where a decision needs to be made on behalf of the common good, the solution is authority. And what that means is not everybody enjoys the same radical capacity for self-determination. And it seems that a concern for the common good requires in some instances, we do not treat people as equals. We don't give everyone equal vote. The person who wants the straw or the pig, who wants the straw, the pig who wants the bricks, may well outvote 
the one who wants to build the dam out of sticks. And that is unequal treatment for the sake of this third thing, the common good. So it seems to me there is good reason for thinking that we really can't make sense of equal treatment or unequal treatment, except with respect to some third thing. And in the law, the third thing that does the work for us, where we legitimately treat some as unequal, legitimately allow some to make decisions and not others, is, is the common good. So um, one final thing, and, and this maybe is a fourth area of questioning, it's the it's just occurring to me now as a add on to the, to the third question. Um, this idea that human dignity is somehow attached to the appearance of persons. It seems to me that if we understand the attachment of dignity to the appearance of persons, we're in danger of individualizing dignity. An animal that seems capable of speaking, an animal that seems capable of recognizing other um, uh, uh, linguistic animals, a reptile that seems to have some kind of mind or personhood, um, seems to be a good candidate for recognition as being an appearance of a person. Following people like Thompson, Philip Afoot, in part Alistair McIntyre, it seems much more convincing for us to link the notion of dignity and personhood to species specific capacities. And I think linking dignity, personhood and so forth and, and worth and value to species specific capacities also saves us from the dangers of those hard cases where an individual might lack the usual species specific capacities. Someone has lost the capacity to be conscious or to speak or to think. And if we over individualize dignity and the personalist account, if it's not linked to species specific natural capacities, I think is in danger of individualizing dignity. If we over individualize it, we do have a situation where there seems to be no appearance of personhood in the severely disabled. So that's the fourth point, I guess. Um, so I'd, I'd leave it at that. And if you can answer all of those questions, it'd be great. If not, uh, if you can illuminate us a bit, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. How much time do I have? Ten minutes. Okay. All right. So it's uh, thank you very much for your wonderful question. Questions. It me. It seems like uh, there is many questions and not that many minutes. <laughs> So um, perhaps I will try to um, answer or to give you some general account in which those questions could be answered. And I think that account, because much of what your much of your um, uh, worries, and especially I think Michael's worries, but also Brian's, um, uh, I think they apply more directly to the personalists which uh, rely on phenomenology only and on appearances only, whereas this personalist account I was inter uh, I was engaged with, that is of Karol Wojtyła and Tadeusz Styczyn, is attached to an implicit sort of um, realism. <laughs> but that realism, because normally we would say, that realism, or at least that's what comes first, realism needs us to have a metaphysics, right? As realists, we build, it's normal that we build metaphysics and we believe that it's true, or at least we make claim to truth, right? But the idea is, and I, actually, honestly, I'm not sure if I'm right, really following the footsteps of Karol Wojtyla and Tadeusz Styczyn. So, because they were really close to the natural law theory to be, to be, to be, Sure, right? So they were kind of taking some Kant into it, but after all, the, the result was at the end Aquinas is right, right? So that, that, that that's the idea. Uh, <clears throat> but what I make of this <laughs> is a commitment to some sort of realism <laughs> which doesn't have to be co automatically connected to metaphysics, <laughs> but rather to certain, well, in a way, common sense sort of uh, considerations. So um, both um, 
uh, Brian's uh, uh, problem or question was that, OK, so uh, how do we know that we are all equal in dignity when when there is like this dignity as being somehow high, right? And Michael's uh, question was, um, yes, um, don't we need some form of substantial sort of naturalism uh, because it, we, we can undermine right the, the dignity? So I think the answer would be um, because dignity as such, right? Dignity as such is not simply in those appearances, <laughs> right? It is not. At, it, it's kind of yeah, and we can say that it shows itself in appearances, but. Uh, a common sense sort of realism should. Um, uh, you know, persuade us to uh, postulate that it's actually outside of these appearances, that it's something like real independently of our perception, <laughs> right? So the idea is that um, human uh, dignity uh, or all those things that I talk about and also all those things that the law does, right? That the law does is rather a sign of dignity, right? It's rather something that pays our attention to dignity rather than dignity itself, <laughs> right? So it can be the case that dignity itself needs further uh, elaboration also very much in this philosophical sense and probably after all, I, I'm actually quite sure about it, building some sort of metaphysics or maybe simply saying that the old uh, Aquinas' metaphysics is, is okay, right? Or right? We, maybe we don't need anything new, basically. <laughs> uh, but what, it, what is, I think, important is to show that the law, um, independently of those metaphysical um, insights that we might have or metaphysical theories that we might build, kind of works on its own terms <laughs> somehow related to dignity and I think it is related to dignity in so in the sense that the let's say active agents not only not maybe not those passive agents in the law right the recipients of care and so on but at least the acting agents they are acting persons right so they are capable of self-determination but they are also perceiving certain things that are true or untrue they know when they are lying or they, when they are feel uh, when they are like uh, having moral integrity on the one when they are losing it and so on and so forth. So apparently um, mm, when they are acting persons, uh, they kind of confirm the dignity, but not their own dignity, but they confirm this dignity that kind of exists somehow. We don't know how or maybe we know how <laughs> that exists outside the law, <laughs> right? So I, I think that's the mm, that's the uh, basis. All right, I still have like four minutes, so um, uh, that would be the general account, right? Which uh, kind of combines some form of realism, although not necessarily uh, in the traditional way, in some some other way, but still it's some form of realism. But, um, and that's the general, um, uh, yes, uh, perspective which we could use to answer those 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 questions. Um, if I have time, I can answer to yeah yeah. Uh, well, so that is why I think somehow we can solve this tension, which is real, uh, between dignity as a high standing, <laughs> between dignity as uh, being uh, honored in the society or whatever, or in the hierarchy of beings, perhaps. In any sense, it's kind of attached to high standing on the one hand, and the equality on the other. So the idea is that in those persons who are um, well capable of reason, right, capable of arguing, we see that dignity, which nevertheless is not attached to them being uh, right. It's not. Uh, it's only a sign of it, <laughs> right? So that equal dignity is something that we, in a sense, must postulate or we postulate after we observe those. Uh, individuals capable of uh, action and reason. And they don't have to be outstand outstanding in this, <laughs> right? I think it's enough to, to observe common folk and how they work, right? So there is no 
elitism in this because even if if somebody is um, you know concerned with uh, going to work and to have food or whatever he still is an acting person <laughs> right so it's 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 not connected to the excellence in morals and stuff like that it's rather connected to this common sense sort of experience and if we observe that and postulate dignity as some sort of explanation of that right uh, or some further implications where we, we, we could debate about that, then this equal dignity is something that we should accept, right? Um, of course, we're going to treat different people differently and we're going to, uh, yes, but the, the idea is, uh, well, I guess I do not have much time left, but in the law specifically, it's different, this maintaining of this basic equal status, it's one form of protecting dignity, I call it in the book basic dignitarian protection, right? And the other thing is, let's say, specific dignitarian protection. When we try to find the best answer, the best account, and it's of course a big question for the law and for authority also, to which extent the law is supposed to, it's, it's a problem of paternalism basically, right? To which extent are we entitled to impose <laughs> those uh, yeah, conceptions of the good person, of outstanding life, individuals. But the idea is, if we stick to the basic status, it's already not that bad, <laughs> right? So maybe judges, for example, should be careful about giving this full answer, like this full specific dignitarian protection. Maybe it's better to leave it to legislators, right? But it's it's one of the of the implications. And now to specifically to Michael's questions, I think, yeah, some, some of them I kind of tried to answer before when I gave this general account. Um, I think there remains, uh, um, what remains unanswered is this uh, authority question, right? So uh, yeah, quite honestly, I do not engage with the notion of authority very closely in the book, but I think in the, in the story you presented about those pigs, right? Uh, with all due respect to, to pigs. Uh, I think it's it's enough to uh, provide a space in which they are able to quarrel, <laughs> right, basically. And, and that's this equal status. And I think unless that equal status and those basic dignitarian interests are, are protected, <laughs> right, the differences other social differences and also differences in authority that we have and different individuals have do not actually violate, right? So in this sense, we are all equal in the sense of having this dignity, uh, equal dignity, if you're buying my argument, if you're not, because it's not that much well observed. You cannot measure it, certainly, right? But uh, yeah, the, the idea is that if you you know, engaging with, with that interpretation, then you should be convinced at least, right? So that's that third element. It's not that much transcendental because it refers to the concrete persons. It doesn't refer to some sort of super persons or personhood of persons, but rather to concrete persons. So we are equal in status and then we can decide, we can overvote, we can even select a king, why not, right? All right, thank you. I, I've used all of my time. Thanks for your questions again. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Rubnowski, uh, for a wonderful talk and for fitting it in an amazingly tight uh, time frame. I just want to take one minute um, to thank everyone who helped us put this event together. A very special thanks to Professor Floyd and the Center for Catholic Studies uh, for sponsoring this event, as well as the School of Health and Medical Sciences uh, at Seton Hall, the School of Law at Seton Hall, uh, the Student Engagement Office, especially Marisol Rivera. Um, and as always, Dana Foreman and his wonderful team. Uh, thank you, Dana. Thank you, Michaela, for getting um, this session all together and streamed. So um, we uh, appreciate everyone. We know there's a lot of people tuning in online um, and please do uh, if you have questions, follow ups, um, 
shoot us an email at ethics at shoe.edu. Follow us online um, here. You'll see all the places you can um, come bug us and check out our resource page um, where we will have information about um, the book. So thank you all. Um, thank you very much.